Well, Jonathan, um, the idea, as I told you before, of this uh, video is just to to get to people who have not yet the opportunity to to have access to your book. Let me show it. The impromptu man. J. L. Moran in the Origins of Psychodrama Encounter Culture and the Social Network. So this could stimulate people to to go to the book and to read it, hopefully, when it comes also in other languages. For the time being it's just in, in English, right? Yes. When it comes to other uh, languages, it will make easy probably for people to have uh, how do you present this book to someone who don't know what is it? To me, it's a uh, you know a work in cultural history, um, it, the sort of story of somebody whose life cuts across improvisational theater, psychotherapy, philosophy, psychology, uh, social science, and especially most recently the idea of social networks um, the social networks that are that are traced and exploited in by social media so for me it's it, it's a story about somebody whose ideas cut across all these different areas well you are talking about your father right because if someone doesn't know uh, from what you say, one could not. Yeah, it sounds very detached, and uh, there's a reason for that. Um, I didn't write, write a memoir, um, first of all, because I'm just not interested in writing a memoir uh, at this point in my life, anyway. Uh, secondly, um, because I am an academic and I wanted to write like an academic, uh, uh, and thirdly, um, because I only came along when he was an older man. Uh, he was 63 when I was born and I of course had no real, uh, not very much memory of him as a person even until he was 70. So I couldn't really write about him as a memoir anyway, as a memoirist, uh, except for the you know, roughly 14 years in which I was conscious and he was, he was still alive. Uh, so his most active period, especially in the U.S., which people have not written about uh, because the records are so poor and for various reasons, um, in his later 30s, 40s, and 50s, that was the period that I was most interested in. So I had to write about it in a somewhat uh, object detached way, I hope somewhat objective way also, because mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't around. Um, so... Um, the other thing that I've noticed, and uh, it will not surprise you, is that many people who are interested in psychodrama assume that I'm interested in psychodrama. And the truth is, I'm really not. <laughs> uh, I'm not really interested in psychodrama per se, or even in psychotherapy per se. I'm really interested in the ideas uh, that are in the culture that are reflected in the work that he did in, in theater, in psychotherapy, and in social science. Mm -hmm. um, but for you, impromptu men. It's not my title. My brilliant editor came up with the title. Uh huh. We had a lot of trouble figuring out the title. Uh, if you called it the the biography of Joe Moreno or the life of Joe Moreno, it wouldn't have any meaning to very many people because they don't know who he is. Um, so that was a big that was a big problem. But when my editor suggested that title to me with that subtitle, uh, I thought that was just right because um, it captures the idea of the you know, people have heard the word impromptu, but it's still sort of provocative. Uh, and um, and this is a guy who was an impromptu guy. I mean, I think it captures the fact that in my view, he was first of all, in fact, a mystic always, but also uh, a theater guy. Uh, and I, in the book I suggest, I don't know if this is true, but I suggest that if he had been able to figure out how to continue in experimental theater, that he would have done that. 
but he couldn't quite make it work. Uh, and, and I think he was, a, he, was, he was practical. It was a depression, early 1930s in the U.S. Um, he had to make a living. Uh, so he, he, he found these opportunities in, in schools and prisons to do this kind of social network analysis. Uh, and he was having a lot of fun with the actors, but it wasn't really leading anywhere, and the critics weren't buying it. They didn't buy it in Vienna, and they didn't buy it in New York. Mm -hmm. um, so the impromptu man sort of recaptures that sense of which all of his work is about impromptu. Uh, what do you do now? Um, and the idea of the of the here and now, which became so important in the 1960s, and the human potential movement and humanistic psychology is an idea that he that he had from much earlier. Among the many ideas that he had before, so many other people did. Mm -hmm. Impromptu man, impromptu son. No, I'm not particularly impromptu. Uh, um, when I go, I just gave a talk about the book at the American Psychiatric Association, uh, and uh, as I pointed out when I started the talk, I'm I'm going to show you a few dozen PowerPoint slides and some films. Um, there's not very much impromptu about this talk. Uh, and if, I, if JL were coming to the American Psychiatric in 2015, as he had gone to the American Psychiatric a couple of dozen times over many years, he would not have done what I'm doing with slides. He would have done a psychodrama, uh, which mm. he did many times. Right? But uh, I'm not doing a psychodrama. I'm not a psychodramatist. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a, I'm not a theater person. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm an academic. I'm a professor. I thought about this talk a lot. Yeah, I spent days and days working on this talk, putting my slides together. <laughs> and I'm going to give you my talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, no, I'm not impromptu, son. Uh -huh. uh, but what happened uh, uh, when we know that uh, you started living, uh, 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 you were born almost psychodramatically, and uh, the, you, you spent the first years of your life uh, living psychodrama. So when you say you are not a psychodramatist, it 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 shocks me. Uh, yes, yeah, somehow <laughs> it shocks me because you you are the one who who had all life from your childhood yes. to your youth times in psychodrama. So you you had all the training. Uh, uh, bro both from your mother, your father. So what happened? I was too mentally healthy to go into the same business that my parents were in. And I, and I, I guess I believe in this respect in nature rather than nurture. You mm -hmm. know, they say the parent of, of one child believes in nurture, the parent of two children believes in nature. Uh, because you see the differences, mm -hmm. even though they're in the same house. Um, I came out temperamentally very interested in what my parents were up to observing it, interested in these crazy characters who are coming through the house and through Beacon, through the hospital, <laughs> the, literally the, the crazy people who are doctors as well as the crazy people who are patients. Um, I, I always found it very interesting and I did participate, uh, but, and I did do psychodrama for a while, um, but I never really identified myself uh, with that. I never really felt totally comfortable doing that. Mm -hmm. And why it took so many years for this book to come? Well, if I'd written it, first of all, I don't think I had the capacity to write it. Um, there, was, I didn't have, there, there wasn't the literature, um, and I don't think I had, was prepared intellectually. Also, I wanted to get established in my own career. Uh, I don't want people thinking that this is all I do, is you know, make a living writing about my father. What could be more depressing? Um, so I wanted to get well established. Nobody can accuse me of of trying to exploit my father's life for various reasons or his work mm -hmm. because I don't do it because he's not except among a certain group of people a very famous person. Um, so and there's no money to be made. <laughs> so uh, also I'm at a certain point in my life when um, you know maybe I won't feel energetic enough to write a, to spend two years on another book like this. I don't know. So it all. Also, I had finished a couple of big projects. I was kind of in between some projects, and I just felt it was the right time. 
Is there something in the book that uh, you think that it was not worked enough that if it would be possible you would like to oh, yeah. Yeah. Re rephrase or redo? Well, you helped me, you gave me a, a couple of key uh, points, particularly um, that incident that I write about in which he and his, um, his friend the English, the, the, the theater and English professor from Hunter College gave a little talk in the Hudson Valley uh, in the late 1920s. I would like, I, I would have gone, I would, I would have, if this had been a more academic book, I was trying to write it for more, a more general audience, uh, and especially people who are not necessarily historians and academics. If I were to, read, to write some more, I would go to some, some more archives. Uh, for example, I'd, I'd go to the R.H. To the Macy Company archives and see if there's any record at all. I don't even know if they have archives, but this is a good project for a graduate student. Or I, I would have gone, and I've said this to my own Ph.D. students in history of science, I would go to the Department of Agriculture archives and see in the 1930s and see what they've got about J.L. working on these planned communities. right? Uh, he, he did a lot more work on that than I had realized. Um, presumably there is correspondence between him and agriculture department authorities about his visits to Washington and his meetings with them. Um, so that I, w I would be interested in, you know, maybe in doing that or having a student do that. Mm -hmm. So there, um, um, I tried to find out if the, if, the, uh, if the Plymouth Church in Brooklyn had any um, anything, any records at all about him, or about Beatrice Beecher, his, uh, his, his first wife. Uh, and uh, the archivist there uh, never seemed to be able to figure that out. <laughs> um, uh, so there were things that I would have done, yes, uh, particularly archival work that you're so good at. I would have done more of that, but fortunately you're doing that. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe, maybe I don't need to. So yes, there are certainly things I would have done. I would have spent more time on some of the newspaper articles that he uh, was featured in in the 1930s. Um, you always have a very hard time in a book like this, right? I wasn't only writing it for people like you who are interested uh, in JL, I was also writing it for other people who didn't know anything. And how, how much time do you spend on a particular topic is a big challenge if you're writing nonfiction, the kinds of books that I write. So that was, that, that was a problem that I faced before. Uh, writing a book that's sort of both academic and both trade, that's a hard line. And you have to decide sometimes um, how much time you'll spend on, on, on something that interests you a lot, but it may be too in-depth in for the reader. Mm -hmm. If you had to, to make a short uh, um, conclusion on what you are meaning with your book, what would this conclusion be? Um, history is written by the winners. Uh, some people are better at designing a legacy than others. Um, JL, the, one of the many sort of ironies of his career is that he was very preoccupied with his priority and his legacy. But he was very bad at setting up the conditions under which his priority would be recognized and his legacy would be appreciated. And there are many reasons that he was bad at it. Some of it was temperamental. He alienated people because he was so insistent on these things. Also, he was not strategic the way, for example, Freud was in managing the pieces on the board. Uh, you know, Freud was very careful. If you read all the, the Freud biographies, it's so interesting how he managed his people. Uh, not always successfully. I mean, Otto Rock, for example, uh, who J.L. knew, um, uh, Rock was alienated. But for the most part, he, you know, he Freud really knew uh, how to ensure that he would be the major figure, even with people like Jung. Um, but J.L. Uh, was bad at keeping people in, the, in his network if he felt that they weren't really being loyal to him. 
uh, he he could not he, he was a little paranoid not in a not in a not the way a mental patient is but he was paranoid in the in the sort of normal way more, but an extreme version of it uh, he insisted on loyalty uh, and if he suspected disloyalty uh, then he would push you out and I saw it even as a kid I saw what he was doing he also had no patience for, for, for academics, especially after the Second World War when academia became much more formal and um, some would say positivistic. The social sciences were becoming more quantitative. So this is a long answer to, it, to, to your question. Mm -hmm. but he, he, he was not good at setting up his establishing the conditions under which he would be remembered for his contributions. Another reason was that he, as you and I just were talking about, he changed his terminology a lot and his definitions. Whenever he thought of a new definition or a new term, he'd introduce that very arbitrarily. Um, so he was not, in that sense also, he wasn't systematic. Now all these things are quibbles, right? Because what he did was really incredibly original in so many ways. His virtues, you know, were his vices and his vices were his virtues. So, uh, but nonetheless, I think a conclusion would be that un undoubtedly there are many other people like him in history, in the history of ideas, uh, who were for very, various reasons not able to um, sustain a public, sort of public recognition. Even though he was a celebrity, I mean, one of the things that really fascinated me, uh, that you know, is that he was a celebrity in the 30s, 40s, and through, I'd say, many, in maybe the late 50s late 1950s in the U.S. Uh, he was in the newspaper quite a lot, and he was in, in, in various surprising ways as a mental expert. Mm -hmm. um, so you can, but if celebrities are off, are, are, can be, if they're only a celebrity, they, they're rapidly forgotten, as Paris Hilton will be forgotten, we hope, uh, right? Uh, it has to be, you have to have, you have to have your name and your ideas in the system in some way, which he, didn't quite manage to do, mm -hmm. not connected to his ideas. Well, finally, to make it short, uh, and because it's supposed to be a short interview also, one could be tempted to think that uh, psychodrama was uh, something that uh, was part of the fashion of the 40s, 50s, 60s and 70s. but. What comes out from your book is that uh, it keeps being uh, used. Could you say something about that? Or is that um, some sort of secrecy in the use of psychodrama? Well, the, you know, as, as he recognized in the 1960s, uh, new institutions were, were, were coming up and uh, old ones were dying. I mean, for example, growth centers were coming up, and then the old mental hospitals were dying, and finally dis completely displaced for the most part in the 1970s. The institutionalization was, you know, part of that. Um, um, so the the ideas and the techniques that are associated with them had to be were transformed by the culture. The ones that were valuable were retained, as we well know. Right? So. Uh, you know, if you see see people do cognitive therapy, they do a little role playing, and they use some of the techniques. For example, um, if you if you talk to people who do social network analysis in the academic world, they know about JL. They see him as the grandfather of the idea of the social network. Um, even some, although not many, some of the younger people who do social media in an intellectual way, like some of the guys at Facebook, I talked to one of them. They, they're, they're aware uh, as well, but not hopefully more, more aware if they find my book. Um, so, I, you know, as the institutions changed, the ideas had to, were, that were valuable were retained, but they had to be reshaped to, to, to fit the institutions. Mm -hmm. And if I understood well, um, it uh, still being used not only for therapeutic purposes, but also for training people. Yeah, and, and I could have done more with that, uh, but uh, there, as I mentioned, you know, if you go to medical school, I teach in the medical school, there is role-playing to teach young medical students how to relate to patients. 
um, law enforcement officers use role playing. Mm -hmm. um, and what what I what it was really interesting, and I keep running into these guys as lawyers, uh, who uh, who learn how to do role playing uh, as part of their preparation to work in a courtroom. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and and JL saw, as I mentioned, the very dramatic characteristics of the courtroom, which is a stage. Um, so, uh, the, it, it's quite clear that uh, if to, what, to whatever extent the idea of role-playing can be attributed to JL, which is clearly a lot, maybe not completely, but a whole lot, um, then you know, he should be recognized as uh, somebody who um, made it possible for lawyers, for business consultants, for doctors, for just about every profession to to uh, to learn how to do what they do in action rather than only talking about it, mm -hmm. including intelligent intelligence, including, including uh, intelligence operatives. Uh, yeah. Um, now, uh, whether uh, I think some of that is still used in, in, in that world. Uh, we know that social network analysis is used mm -hmm. data from your cell phone or your email, and this is what the public debates have been about. How. Um, how much, how much uh, uh, we're being watched, how much are, you know, what are the limits to our privacy? This is a big political philosophy question. Um, um, so we know that, uh, uh, that, that they did use it, these ideas to, during, certainly during the Second World War and probably afterwards as well. Um, some of the inspiration for group therapy clearly came from JL. During the war, it, because there were so many people with post-traumatic stress disorder during the Second World War, not enough psychiatrists, they had to have groups. You know, it's very hard to trace these ideas with confidence, but, but we can be sure that JL was a very significant player in developing the idea of group therapy. Um, uh, now, you, can, you, you can't even turn on a, 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 a television show or watch a movie, it seems, without seeing some reference to some of these ideas. So as we sit here, three days before uh, the last episode of a very popular series called Mad Men uh, was on HBO. I'm sure uh, your students will, many of them will have seen Mad Men. It was a very successful seven-year series. And the last episode has the central character uh, going to a group therapy, uh, where many of his issues are resolved. Uh, in 19, around 1970, 1971, in mm -hmm. the show. It, uh, you know, so you, you can't avoid these things everywhere. <laughs> Anything else, Jonathan? That's enough. Thank you. Good.